Well, good evening. It is a thrill to be here this morning. I was at Dr. Sterling's church, Timothy Eaton, historic pulpit, and now here in this beautiful, beautiful building in this storied pulpit. It's a great privilege to be here for the Lester Randall Preaching Festival among some very illustrious men and women who will be speaking over the next couple of days, and I am humbled and quite frankly a little intimidated to be up here tonight. And uh, <clears throat> except for that very catty remark from Steve, I, I was quite, um, I, you know, I, when, when uh, I was introduced, I thought, yeah, I got excited about hearing myself. <laughs> and I have to say, actually, Malcolm, um, y- you could probably read the phone book and it would be a profoundly spiritual <laughs> experience, but what a prayer. Thank you. It's beautiful. I am a sucker for cities. I grew up most of my life in small towns, and I am the quintessential proverbial gaping bumpkin when it comes to a city. I I look at the tall buildings, all the gog. I look at the monorails. I look at all the traffic, and I love to go to the galleries Uh, There's hardly a city I've been in that I haven't been astonished. And so it's a bit difficult for me to get into Paul's mindset at the beginning of this text that Robin read so well in Acts 17, beginning in verse 16. Uh, This theme of the Randall preaching, Randall Lester preaching festival is Advent. And my single Advent comment is this, is this text is Advent for Athens. This is Paul bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to Athens. <clears throat> it does not begin so hopefully. It begins with Paul wrecked. The, the phrase that gets usually translated, and Paul was distressed to see all of the idols It's the word for paroxysms. It's the man is being throttled with emotion, gasping, gagging, heart sick at what he sees. And there's a part of me that says, what's wrong with you, Paul? This is Athens. (laughs) I mean, it may not be the heyday of Athens when Paul happened to visit it, but we've got the Parthenon, we've got the Agora, we've got the Acropolis. I mean, what don't you like? (laughs) This is a great city. This is the pinnacle of civilization. This is the cradle, though we don't know it at that point, of Western culture. And you go around feeling heartsick. The American journalist H.L. Mencken, who lived 100 and some years ago, I never liked religion to begin with, but his coverage of the Scopes Monkey Trial, a a landmark event in the religious history and, in fact, the cultural history of America, our neighbors to the south, uh, it inflamed Mencken's uh, extraordinary disdain. And he described the Puritan, the fundamentalist. Here was his definition of Puritanism. The fear that someone somewhere is having fun. <laughs> and is, is that Paul? Is that Paul? Well, this morning I got up. It was a beautiful morning. And uh, in preparation to go preach at Dr. Sterling's church, I went for a walk. And I realized that I walk around a beautiful city like Toronto And I'm not heartbroken enough, not that it's not a wonderful city, but I I think the question becomes not what, what is wrong with Paul walking around Athens feeling distressed at all the ways people are trying to find God in all the wrong places. But the question is, why doesn't it distress me more? Why do I just gawk and gape? I want to suggest as I walk through this text, and I'll have to do that quite quickly, but that Paul has continually gone through a number of conversions in his life. (laughs) Uh, We know the famous one, Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus, and 
slaps him upside the head, so to speak, knocks him around, tells him what's going to happen. And, and, and Paul has this radical turning to Jesus Christ. But I think what we document, especially through the book of Acts, is Paul's being converted over and over to a deeper understanding of God's heart for people. And I would suggest that at the very foundation of the impulse of Paul's longing to share good news with people is his capacity for heartbreak for the ways people are looking for God in all the wrong places. And I would suggest that uh, rather than Paul being Mencken's definition of the Puritan, someone who lives with the fear that someone somewhere is having fun, that actually at the very core of Paul as a Christ follower is this, the fear that someone somewhere is not having fun. That somebody is hungry for truth or they're hungry for hope or they're hungry for something that will matter in their life and they look here and they can't find it and they look there and they can't find it and they, they lurch from thing to thing and parts, Paul's heart is breaking and saying, if you knew, <laughs> if you knew, you would come running to him. <laughs> And I think Paul has been gripped by the same vision that the same heart that Jesus Christ had. Remember when Jesus met the woman at the well, John 4, that woman everyone was avoiding? I mean, everyone was avoiding her. (laughs) And he begins actually very winsomely with this question, this request. Can can you help me, Jesus says? Can, Can you give me something to drink? And the conversation begins, and finally Jesus says to her, if you knew the gift of God, and the one who's speaking to you right now, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Aren't you thirsty? Aren't you thirsty? All these ways you're trying to fill yourself, satisfy yourself, find hope, and it's not working, isn't it? Aren't you thirsty for the real thing? If you knew. And so the first conversion we see in Paul is uh, this conversion that he begins to have the heart of God for people. He begins to, uh, as Jesus looked out on the great city of Jerusalem in Luke 19, and it says that he looked upon that city and he wept And he said these words, if you only knew (laughs) where you would find peace, but it's hidden from your eyes. I think that's exactly what's going on in Paul's heart. That's a pretty radical conversion. (laughs) To have gone from a man that was a a bit like Jonah when we first meet Paul, uh, proud of his heritage and disdainful of everybody who doesn't know what he knows. (laughs) to this heartbreak, if you knew. I would suggest that all, uh, all our, our impulse to share good news with people actually begins with that, that, that sorrow, that heartbreak, that wanting, wanting what we have, not in some smug way, superior way, but as John Stott said from that story in Second Kings, that we're, we're beggars, we're lepers, telling other lepers where we found the bread. <laughs> if you knew. Think about Jesus sharing uh, this series of parables in Luke 15, three of them, about lost things. Lost sheep, lost coins, lost son or sons. <laughs> And subversively, he speaks to the, the religious leaders of his day who have lost a brokenheartedness over the people that they were meant to bless and to lead. They, they've stained them. They walk at a distance from them. They walk in contempt of them. 
And Jesus very subversively begins the first two of his parables in Luke 15 with this. Suppose one of you lost something to you. <laughs> Ever lost anything that mattered to you? I remember losing Nicola on Rath Trevor Beach. <laughs> and you know how large that beach is up in Parksville. Uh, it goes on for kilometers, and when the tide goes out, it probably goes out a kilometer. And she was not quite two years old, and we turned her back for a moment, and she just went missing. And my world stopped. I could not breathe for fear. Thousands of people on the beach and a huge force behind it, and I... If somebody came up to me at that moment and told me that I had just won some huge sum of money, I wouldn't have cared. <laughs> Because the thing that mattered to me so much, my little girl, was lost. Suppose one of you <laughs> lost something to you and it, and it really broke your heart. <laughs> and so I don't think Paul's being some old crank. I think he's got the heart of God. That's a first conversion. But then watch what he does. Uh, he takes this distress that he feels and the next conversion is he converts it, converts it into reasoning. Now, the text that Robin read said arguing, but a better translation is he went and reasoned in the synagogue and in the marketplace. Don't you long, especially in this political climate, that will be the only remark I will make, <laughs> for a return to reasonableness? Um, that when we, when we somehow feel that we, we have some urgent message to communicate, that it's not with stridency, and it's not with anger, and it's not with defensiveness, and it's not with assault, but reasoning. <laughs> and so Paul goes and reasons, but uh, it gets him uh, some attention from the Philosopher's Club down at the Areopagus. Lots of debate. Was it sort of functioning as a bit of a tribunal? Was he uh, uh, almost put on trial down there? We don't know. Which one is mine? I swear, there's sort of this juggling glasses here. But anyhow, the eggheads, see, the intelligentsi invite him down because they hear him and they're curious. Uh, Luke makes this little sort of snarky remark that all they do around sit, array, sit around all day and just listen to the newest ideas. And one of them says this, Paul is a babbler, and the, the, the original means he's a scavenger. He's, he's a, it's a bird that sort of picks up anything on the ground. He's a scavenger. It's a seed picker. <laughs> well, I would suggest uh, uh, quite otherwise, Paul isn't sort of the scavenger just picking up random ideas here and there. Paul actually is a seed sower. <laughs> and here's, again, he's taken to heart this conversion of Paul. When he looks at a situation, he looks at a city, and his heart is breaking over how much they are missing God. <laughs> They're look, looking for him in all the wrong places. And his impulse is to reason and it is to sow seed wildly. Mark 4 like. Jesus said a sower went out to sow. And he was, he was sort of extravagant about it. He, he wasn't penurious. There was no stinting. There's no, it's just whew, everywhere. And, and so Paul is just sowing seed. He's not a seed picker, he's a seed sower. He's being extraordinarily generous. And then I would suggest the conversion that maybe is most astonishing in the heart of Paul is when he finally gets to go to the, the, the Areopagus, the pinnacle of all that sort of represents the culture of Athens, whatever that might be in Toronto. He goes to some elite club and gets to speak and he does the most amazing thing. He takes the idolatry that he's seen in the city that has distressed him, and he turns that idolatry into icon. I see you're looking for God. <laughs> you're very religious, he says. <laughs> you see, the difference is an idol is an attempt to reduce God to 
a size we can control and manipulate, whereas an icon is some picture that we have of God that is an attempt to find him and reach out to him. And Paul, that, I, don't, I can't think of any other language to describe what happens here when he gets there and he's converted this distress over what's happening and saying, in my maybe pharisaical mind, he might be having a little um, you know, pharisaical hangover here at first. Uh, in the way I would look at this before, I would simply be distressed and angry at all the idolatry, but now I see what's really going on. You want God. You want God. <laughs> and guess what, I'm gonna tell you about the God that I know. It's very winsome. I, I think the iconography of our current moment in some ways, we could uh, name a number of things, but uh, when, when I was a young lad, only sailors and, and, and uh, people in the army had tattoos. <laughs> and there's a, an amazing iconography going on in tattoos. Here, here's just a little tip. I found if you go into a restaurant or a pub and you are uh, virtually, it would be very rare for you not to be served by somebody who had tats. <laughs> And it is an amazing conversation that you can have with a person by simply saying, that's a beautiful tattoo, can you tell me about it? And they will begin to open up something of their life that often is a not so veiled search for some deep meaning. I just had one of these last week in Calgary. And what Paul does then is he gets the opportunity to tell them about the God he knows, and I think this is his, his, his most wise and winsome approach to sharing good news is though it begins with his distress at the idolatry he sees in Athens. He does not go directly in attacking what they believe. He, he makes some, some remarks about you could do better. <laughs> but what Paul fundamentally does, and I would say this is the work of the church of Jesus Christ, is he holds God up in all of his beauty. <laughs> he just keeps holding God up, lifting God. If I be lifted up, I will draw people unto me. Just lift me up. And he lifts up the God. He says, this God has made everything. He needs nothing, but he wants one thing. He made everything, needs nothing, wants one thing. And that be you. <laughs> he's, he's rigged up the whole thing, the entire thing. Made, given, provided. He knows exactly where you live. He knows your name. And the whole thing is that so that you might reach out to him. <laughs> the God who made everything, makes everything, needs nothing, but wants something above all, and that would be you. Is that, is that sound like good news? <laughs> I was in, uh, when I lived on Vancouver Island, not far from where Peter and Janet have their, their summer home or their vacation home, uh, a, a lady in the congregation asked if, if I would come. She, she ran a daycare and she asked if I would come uh, and, and talk about my vocation, what I did with her little four-year-olds. And um, this is the longest hour of my life. <laughs> so, so I go, and uh, I, I, I could not believe the energy and the distractedness of these, these little tykes. And they are t tumbling everywhere, and, and they're picking their nose, and they're hitting each other, and they're laughing, and they're crying. And I'm trying to talk to them uh, like, a, like a responsible adult, and, and they're not paying any, me any mind. And uh, so I'm, I'm just supposed to tell them what I do. That's it. And I can't get their attention at all. So this is a complete defeat. And then finally, I, I have a, an, an idea. And I said, um, uh, I actually get to tell people stories. Would you like to hear one of them? 
And they said yes. And I asked them uh, at the beginning when I told them as a pastor if they knew what that was and only one thought they did. So, so these are uh, not, not just little tyrannical people, tiny, but, but, but you know, little pagans really. And, uh, <clears throat> And so I, I said, uh, d- so, so let me tell you one of the stories. And I said, there's a story about a boy and uh, he was really, really rotten, really bad little guy. And he started uh, hitting his sister a lot and he started stealing stuff from his mom and dad. And what would you do, uh, what would happen if, if you, you did that in your home? And they're like, oh, I'd be in so much trouble. And I said, yeah, well, he was, he was in a lot of trouble. And finally he just had enough and he ran away. He took a bunch of stuff from his dad and he ran away. And he went off and he's having a lot of fun until he wasn't. And then one day he decides, um, you know, I'm, there's always food to eat at dad's house. I think I'll go home and, and see if dad would be kind to me. Maybe he would let me be a servant. I know I've forfeited sonship. But maybe he'd let me work in the fields. And, and so I, I said, uh, he makes this journey home and he sees his dad far off and I said to these little people, if if you'd done all these really rotten things, what do you think it'd be like coming back and your dad seeing you? And they said, oh, I'd be in so much trouble. I said, yeah, he he thought so. Then he sees his dad running to him. And I think maybe at first he was scared. My dad's so mad at me, he's coming to, you know, give me a, give me a scolding or licking or something. But then he noticed his dad's arms are wide and his dad is beaming with joy and weeping and weeping and weeping. <laughs> and his dad throws his arms around him and he says, oh son, I'm so glad you're home. <laughs> And the son wants to say, I'm sorry for all the things he did, but the dad says, no, no, let's just get in and and there's so much food to eat and there's so much, there's a party happening. (laughs) And at this point, these little kids, I I totally have them. They're utterly wide-eyed. They're they're gaping. They're amazed. And I said, "And, and so if ever, 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 at any point in your life, you're interested in God, you're interested in, in the Father in heaven, and you want to know what he's like, I just want you to remember this story. If you knew, you'd go running to him. Thanks so much.